don't ever do this electronically. I'm always like, I'm right there and I'm very, all my hands are all over the place and yada, yada, yada. So I put some scientific stuff in here, but um, I might like skip through it because I'll just be yapping. So um, let me just try and escape out of this thing if I can. There we go. I am recording this if everyone is okay with that so that we can share sure. it with the folks who did not attend, did, weren't able to attend tonight. Sure. Sure. No so I um, want to give a shout out to the Orange County Beekeeping Association because um, their outreach coordinator hooked me up with some of these slides. And then I had one that I had done um, a long time ago. So I, it's sort of a mishmash, um, but it's a really great resource. And hopefully I can pass this on to them then to use. We've never really done these virtually before. So, so honeybees are our friends. Um, you probably all know why, but what's what's a big important reason that we want to have honeybees in our lives? I like to eat, eat our food. food so we can eat. Yeah. Right, because they are responsible for pollinating our food. And I'm trying to advance here, but it's not advancing. Hold on one sec. Bear with me here. Okay, well, I'm just going to talk through this. I got a cute little slide with a margarita on it. And I was going to say, what do these things have in common? But um, <laughs> so um, honeybees populate a third of the world's food directly and actually indirectly they populate or they pollinate almost up to like upwards of three quarters of our food because they're responsible for other things that pollinators, other pollinators need. So um, but um, one the, the connection with the margarita is that they um, pollinate lemons, broccoli, cashews, coffee, limes, um, onions, watermelon, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're really important. Um, still not wanting to advance, but okay. Um, I just have some really good pictures here. Um, shoot guys, just hold on. Cause it, they're it's lined up, but yeah, it's, it um, stuck for Jean and me earlier and then I was able to get it to go. So let's just see, let me just see if it works again. Ah, there we go. Okay. Oh, yay. <laughs> okay. I love that. <laughs> okay. That's a Mexican bee, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's not what? Oh. All right, I'm going to try one more time. I don't know why I hit advance and it won't go. Okay, hold on. It sounds like mine. I know I was so worried about the storm. All right. All right. Well, um, you know what? If you don't mind, um, go like that. I don't know. Should we get off or we got? No, she's, no, she's there. In the... No, no, I'm just, I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know why it's not doing that. Let me just unplug my monitor real quick and see if that has something to do with it. First of October before we do show. Um, oh, here we are. <laughs> okay, here you are. Screen sharing stopped. Okay. Uh, Los, okay, it's my internet. Darn it. It's saying I have low systems resource. Okay, I'm just going to talk a little bit. Okay, okay. so um, you can see me, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, I might put you on here. Let's, it just came back again. Here we go. Started okay, screen sharing. There we go. Okay, what are, you, what are you seeing? The bees or are you seeing my park sign? Park. Park sign. Park sign. Okay. All right. PDF, PDF, PDF. Oh, that's your, your PowerPoint. Yeah. You can't see the PowerPoint, right? No. <sighs> I'm sorry. Okay. All yeah, right. Well, computer. yeah. Whoa, too. That's Washington. Um, Don't call. <laughs> anyway. Email it to right. me and I can see if I can bring it up. Okay, let's see if that works. It won't let me even escape out of it. Like I'm, I can't, um, I'm hitting, you know how you escape to get out of presentation mode? 
Okay. Um, and now I can't even see you guys because I can't. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to. You might try your cell phone's um, uh, hotspot if your internet is uh, unstable. Yeah, Sometimes that okay. works better. Yeah. yeah, we were I, worried about this storm um, yes. having an impact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. So, I, I, I thought about that, too. We had a storm a couple hours ago. Yeah. So, so well, you guys can see me, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, me. so, all right, Jean, while I'm doing this, I'm going to talk about bees, and why don't you pull up that video so you've got it um, handy and queued up, because you can play the video at least. Yes. I, I might, um, golly... Um, I'm going to close this and so, uh, anyway, so they're, so bees are really important because they pollinate and, um, they also are, um, they are not people usually, they get a bad rap because people think that they're really, you know, aggressive, but they aren't because when they sting you, do you know what happens to them? They die. Right. Yeah. So they are not motivated to sting you at all. They do that out of defense. So the most likely time that they might sting you is if you're going into their hive. So that's why you take some precautions to when you're going in the hive, which I'll talk about when you see the tour, and the video. Um, <clears throat> so they're uh, a full hive is made up of roughly 50 to 60,000 bees, depending on the size of your hive, um, the size of your equipment. And um, it is largely made up of um, female worker bees, which are, if you, when you joined, that was the, the actual bee that you saw um, the picture of, the screensaver of. Golly. Um, you know what I think we should do? Jean, I wonder if you should play that and I should log off and try and rejoin. You're off, your volume's off, Jean. Um, um, yeah, Do you yeah. want me to start at the beginning where you're loading in the queen? Yeah. Gosh, darn okay. it, I want to be able to see it, though. <laughs> I want to talk to you about it. I see the queen. That's Why don't you leave and come right back in? All right. I, I'm going to have, I think I have to reboot my computer because I can't escape at all. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> all right. Let me go ahead and um, pull up screen share. Hold on one moment. We really did test all of this out this afternoon. <laughs> we had everything working. We understand we've been there and done that. <laughs> oh, and then the storm came. Hold on. Okay, that's what I wanna share. It's nice to see people without masks. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? This is, this is the only way I get to see people without masks is on Zoom. <laughs> it's on Zoom. You're right. Okay, let's see. Share screen. Okay. Okay, there you are. So you see... Oh yeah, she's got the yes. queen, yeah. Okay, so this, um, there's two little parts on the front end that were videos that she already had. And we just added those to our video from the garden. Um, so I will go ahead and start these. Let me make sure um, that sound is attached. Hold on. Can you hear her? No. no, not yet. Okay. Hold on. The volume looks like it's on down there. If you click on that. Yeah, you have to click on something through um the green. Do there it. we go. Oh, there there we it go. goes. It's the cork. So see? Got her now. Is the queen is in there. See see her right there? See how big she is? Yep, she's cute. Oh. There's a lot of bees falling in there. You just shaking bees in there, Ann? I'm shaking bees! Shake and bake? Come on. Yes. Okay, so I'm lighting the smoker. 
And the smoker is basically um, a way to um, mask the way the bees kind of communicate to each other. They communicate with pheromones, so this masks that smell. And so um, my bees are Italian bees, which is what you usually see in this area. And um, they're really, really actually gentle bees. So there's a lot of times I will light the smoker and I don't do a thing with it. Um, uh, I will say I, I have my sister and brother-in-law live in Vermont and they kept bees for a little while and they had Russian bees and those bees were not nice. <laughs> they were really um, not as gentle. So, okay. So this, this is, um, this is a hive. This, these are, these are called the hive bodies, the two main hive bodies. So they also, we also call them a deep for reasons. You can see they're deeper, you know, and then this is what we call a super, which is, um, a smaller frame, um, mediums. And, um, that's where typically when you're trying to collect honey, you know, make sure you're taking a honey harvest, you put a super on. Um, I will say at this point, um, I was worried about perhaps a swarm a few weeks ago. So I left that on there with some empty frames and I'm fine if the queen wants to go up there and lay because I just wanna give her room. I don't want to swarm. Um, and then I also have right up on top here, a feeder. Um, so I am have that, that pot full of, it's like a sugar syrup, kind of like what you'd feed a, a, a hummingbird. And so when we're done, I'm gonna fill that up. So I have not been in the hive for about two weeks. And so we're gonna see what's going on in here. Hopefully there are no swarm cells, which would mean they'd want us um, swarm. And this was Hopefully filmed about that. a month ago. So this top thing is the... So what, you know, I fill this up with the syrup and then the, the bees can go right in there. Um, and, it, you know, it's separated, but the, the liquid flows in. And you can, um, I wish you could smell it. It's, it's, and you'll see this, I don't know if you can see this kind of gunk that's on here. I can scrape it off and it's all along here. They call that propolis. And that's what the bees put on as a protectant <clears throat> to kind of seal out any critters coming in. Um, and it actually has some antioxidant value to it, I guess, if you will. I'm gonna, let me, I'm gonna put this right on top of here and drag it out of the way. antioxidant properties is what I meant to say. Um, and I'm pretty sure they form that they are gathering, um, I think it's sap from bushes a lot that they get and bark. And then that's how they form the propolis. So typically, so this, um, this is an eight frame hive and they come in either eight frames or 10 frames. And I was just advised when I got it, just because I'm not as upper body strong as like a, a, a full grown male would be, is to get um, an eight framer because um, it's just when they're full of honey and stuff, it's very heavy to lift them. So um, I've always run eight framers and typically you start on the outside and you, um, yeah, and this is feeling really light. So I'm glad I'm feeding them. Um, you can see a teeny bit of, um, nectar or honey in there. Um, but they are, the outside frame is typically farthest away from the brood nest. The brood nest is usually within the inner frames. So you always take one of those out. And um, so you don't, so you give yourself a little room here. Oops. So oh, in, I'm sorry. A, in a um, hive, <laughs> about 60,000 bees in a full, full blown hive. And so, um, this one you can see do you mind if i come a little closer no, to you fine. so they don't want to hurt you because honeybees will die if they mm -hmm. sting you and so um this is actually not showing a wonderful brood pattern i think my other one's going to show that better but i don't know if that'll go straight on can you see the little white larva in there oh yeah okay so those are different um yeah. stages of larva and the capped off ones that are the brown that's capped larva do you want to stop it right there yeah. hi guys <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> I think it's working. But so did you, I don't know if you can see in there. So um, the, the, the way the honeybee, um, the life cycle goes is that they're laying an egg. She lays an egg and then, which looks kind of like a piece of rice. 
Um, did I talk about that? Not yet. No, not yet. Okay, it looks like a single piece of rice right in the center of the, um, the cell. And um, then they um, feed it royal jelly for the first few days, first three days, which kind of looks like mucus. And then it um, progresses into the larva, which you can see how those middle things, can you see my thing right now, my cursor? Warner, yeah. 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 Okay. So these, these little white larvae in there are, they're yeah. the, the little worms. Jean, you, you move yours. Is that what you guys see? Somebody moving? Yeah, that's my yeah. cursor. Is Can you see it? mine now? Yeah. That's, I don't, do you see two cursors or just one? Just, just one, one, but one way down at the bottom of the screen. That may be ours. <laughs> yeah, that's yours. Um, do you want to stop and no, take control? Now. Yeah. If you, did you make me? Um, oh, let me do that again. Is it? Oh yeah, that's ours. Okay, now you're a co-host again. Okay. And do you have your um, video up? Um, uh, yeah, but I'm sh you're sharing your screen, so. Okay, so I can stop share, and then you want to take over. You know. Or do you want to uh, just run from here? Yeah, just run from here, and then I'll be quiet, and then I'll talk about it at the end. It's okay, well, it's you fun. can tell me to stop at any time. Okay. Yeah, I'll go like this when I mean for you to stop. Okay. Yeah, we'll be over there. Okay. Rainbow that's up top, if you will, this rainbow pattern. That's usually where they store honey and pollen, but you can see that is pretty darn empty. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be feeding the heck out of this. It's it's a it's a mixed bag because I like I said two weeks ago I was worried about a swarm, so I would rather have to feed them and give them a lot of room. <laughs> oh, and look at this. Here's the queen. Take a little shot of that. Do you oh, see her right in that lower corner, right there? Do you see her? I can't point. She is right. You're going to see it a little bit more, Jean. It's like one more second. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep, keep going. Yeah. She, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There she is. There. Now you can do it. So that's it. Oh, yeah. See how much bigger she is? Oh, so her, God. Yeah. her abdomen, which is called, um, it, it's, a, it's a swollen or a filled spermatheca, which is basically when she mates, um, she goes up on her virgin flight and mates over a few days with about 10 to 15 drones. And she stores that sperm then for the rest of her life and it makes her abdomen swell. And so she's, um, she's very heavy and sort of laborious, but that's what she does is stay in the hive and lay eggs from two to five years. So um, when they do swarm, I'll tell you about a swarm after but when they swarm, they actually, the girl, the bees, the, the collective worker bees actually like poke and prod the queen and don't let her rest at all so that she loses weight um, in the preparation for the swarm so that she's able to fly. And then the, you know, they, when they swarm is basically how the, the hive recreates and the, the queen will leave, that mother queen will leave with about two thirds of the, of the bees, the worker bees and go to, and you'll see them like hanging out on a tree somewhere or um, on a park bench. And that's a swarm. And actually they're, they're most docile then because they're not protecting any brood. So they're not worried about, you know, so you can actually, as a beekeeper, when you catch a swarm, you can look like a rock star because you just walk up without gloves on or anything. You just hit the bee into the box because they, they don't really care about you. But um, the whole thing is that you want to knock the queen into the box and then they know and they will follow her and stay with her. So um, if you've ever seen those old tiny um, um, circus videos with like somebody with a bee beard, you know, what that's a swarm and they've put the queen on their chin or on their throat and all the bees. Now I am not brave enough to do that, but that's what that is. <laughs> anyway. Okay. You can go ahead. Thank you, Jean. Good. So as a beekeeper, you're typically looking to, you know, you want to inspect the hive, but one of the things you want to see that could tell you that you have a queen, if you don't really get your eyes on her, is that there are some eggs. So an egg looks like a, a like a little piece of um, rice laid perfectly in the center of the cell. And so um, when you see that, you're like, okay, good. I know I've got a queen in there and that she's laid it laid today because the, the, um, the egg is usually laid and then they put um, feed, the, feed it royal jelly for the first mm -hmm. three days. And it really just looks like it's got like a mucusy kind of um, substance in there on the second and third day. And then it starts to really, you can start to see the little larva forming like a little white worm. But um, when you see that just plain piece of rice in there, you're like, well, that queen laid that today. So 
so this one is definitely heavier. Wow. And so you can see there's a lot of honey, capped honey. This is your typical, um, with my leg, I'm just a little unsteady, but um, you usually have this rainbow pattern. So here's the, here's the honey. And then you can see there's capped larva. And then I'm assuming there are, well, when it's capped, they're growing into pupa in there, but let's see what's, it's really hard in the light. I don't know if I can see an egg in there. Yeah, I didn't see I, any. Yeah, there might be some in that lower corner. But, um, and then these are all capped. If I turn it this way. Okay. I'll look at a few more. I'll pull up the next one and actually point out. I can't believe we saw the queen. That's such a <laughs> that's such a cool. home run. <laughs> it's usually a crowd pleaser. Um, so uh, the female worker bees make up about um, you know the vast majority of the the population of the hive. And at this time of year, you'll find less um, drones, which are the males. In the spring, you start to see a little bit more because they're gearing up for any kind of swarms so that they can mate with other queens you know, other virgin queens. So, um, I'm just trying to see if I can find a... So these are all worker bees. Let's see if I can find... I do not see a drone right now. Anyway, so I can see that this, you know, we've got the nice honey here, but there's no pollen in there. Mm. See, there's nothing in there. We'll see if we got some in some other frames. I'm, I'm pleased to see some open cells because I should not then see any um, swarm cells at all because of that. Can you, Jean, yeah, can you stop it? Thank you. So I just want to explain this because I would have talked a little bit about this. So I don't know if you just heard what I said. I was pleased to see open cells. So I told you a little bit about a swarm. Remember I said they were kind of pinching at the queen to make her thinner and whatnot. That's how the hive reproduces. So it is in their nature, it's their instinct to try to reproduce the hive. And the whole um, reason that they know they have to reproduce it is because there's not enough room for the queen to lay. So they have jam packed that thing with um, lay, you know, they've made enough room for her to lay out eggs. They've filled the extra space with honey and pollen. So there's just no place for her to, to lay. And so the way, um, the way they do that. So collectively that decision is being made really by the worker bees, which I said is the vast majority. Like, let's say that's 80 to 90% of the bees in there. Um, they, if they're deciding that it's time to swarm, what they will do is feed, a. a uh, a fertilized egg, something different. So all bees get fed um, royal jelly the first three days after the, the egg is laid. But on the next, on day four, they usually change over to a mixture of um, carbohydrates and protein, which is honey and, um, and uh, pollen, nectar and pollen, excuse me. And so they will switch over and give the, the egg that, which starts to turn into the larva. But if they want it to be a queen, they continue only to feed it royal jelly, which is super, super high um, nutrient content, antioxidant content. You know, you, if you've ever heard of that before, they use it a lot in like, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, they have it a lot in their makeup products and stuff. It's very high end. So, um, so it's like this super food. And uh, then in you, you've seen a few different things where I've showed uh, in those frames, I've, you've seen that um, capped brood, you know, it's like the darker brown capping. So if it's a queen cell, they actually um, build it out into like a teardrop. It looks almost like an almond or a teardrop hanging off the um, frame. So as a beekeeper, you see that. So you never, you don't want to see that, especially at this time of year, it would be detrimental because that means they're going to swarm and which means they basically are creating those, those swarm cells, those queen cells, and they'll do like, you know, five to 10. And um, that is basically 
their their way of leaving behind a queen. And then that mother queen leaves with, as I said, like two thirds of the hive population and they leave behind a whole bunch of brood and those other queen cells and um, so, you know some nurse bees. And when those queen cells hatch, it's fight to the death. That's you know the the fittest wins. And so the um, they, the queens will rip down the, each other's uh, queen cells and open them up, and which they're all usually hatching right around the same time, and they fight and the strongest wins. So um, it's kind of cool. When I usually say that for when I do these for kids, they're all like, yeah, and they're like, tell me about the queen again. They love that. <laughs> so. So, um, so it's a really, it's, it, I mean, honestly, it's fascinating, but again, as a, as a beekeeper, if that happens in the spring, which is really, that's the very much the swarm season, you have enough time for their, them to build up their numbers again, their population. Cause remember I said, they're taking about two thirds of the population and leaving. And <clears throat> it stinks from a beekeeper standpoint, because you want to have a lot of bees in your hive that are mature, that can go harvest honey when we have our honey, when, when we have our honey flow, when the nectar's flowing here. Um, but it stinks from that standpoint, but you know, you have the whole summer for them to a get the queen mated and get her to start laying, which is usually like from the time those queen cells are laid and maturing to the time she actually lays an egg is about a month. You just in your head are like, okay, I'm going to lose a month, but, um, they have enough time then to, to build up their population. But as I said, at this time of year there, it isn't because the, the queens are starting to slow down once this weather starts to get cooler, they won't lay, um, she won't lay any eggs when it gets cold. They, they don't, um, I can't remember if I say this in the video, but they do not, my, they don't hibernate. They stay uh, awake, if you will, all winter long. So um, anyway, just that's it. I'm yapping. So go ahead. I just couldn't let that go. You know, we've got the nice honey here, but there's no pollen in there. Mm. See, there's nothing in there. We'll see if we got some of some other frames. I'm, I'm pleased to see some open cells because I should not then see any um, swarm cells at all because of that. When you say open cells, you mean like they've opened them and they're con gorging on the honey? Is that no, no, mean? there's nothing, room for her, the queen to lay. Oh, okay. So like right down here in this lower corner, there's nothing in there. Right. So that's empty space that she could lay. Right. And then you can see over here, that's pretty much filled in. Uh -huh. And for a queen, the the laying pattern is important. You want it to see how that's sort of like a wall of, of um, capped brood. That's a good thing. You want to see it like that. You don't want to see a lot of interspersed. I'm not sure what these these are. They might be, there might have been a dead carcass in there or something and the, the worker bees will clean it out. But that overall is a, is a good laying pattern. When do you harvest? So, if, so the honey flow in our area starts around late March, early April. It's gotten earlier. It used to be like mid-April. Um, do you know what a tulip poplar tree is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's usually like as the tulip poplars go, the, the honey flow goes. So that's about when it starts and then it goes through, you know, it depends on how much rain we have and whatnot, but somewhere around June. And so typically people harvest, you know, I usually harvest in like July, mm -hmm. um, but you can harvest whenever you want. You know, the whole key is though, you know how I have that feeder you would not want to have your supers on feeding while you have, you would not want to feed while you have your supers on that you're collecting honey from, because you don't want to have sugar honey. You know, you want to have honey that is made from purely the nectar of the flowers. So this one has more honey. I can feel it. It's just way heavier. And I think those bottom cells are probably all, They're all empty. empty. Yeah. So there's lots of space. Do you see a drone? Uh, I haven't seen one yet. Uh, I want to show you. So all the brood we've seen has been um, has been female drone or female well, brood. Yeah. You know, sometime in July typically. But again, as long as you pull off the frames or don't have them on there, you can harvest later in the year. It doesn't matter. A lot of people, not a lot. Some people do a fall, a fall harvest as well. 
you know, they'll do one in May or if they've got a really gangbuster spring and then they do another one in like October. So in here, here we don't have a ton of stuff that's blooming um, then, but uh, in the mountains, I think that's when the um, sourwood, people will harvest then. Sourwood honey is a hot commodity. So I'm gonna put this back together and I'm gonna lift it off and look down the bottom one. So um, I mentioned a little earlier when, you know, when they're trying to swarm because they feel like it's too crowded, they create these um, daughter cells and they're usually, um, they'll do like five or 10 or 15 of these swarm cells, these daughter cells. And that is a lot of times what I'm looking for to see what they are. So those are kind of built out like a teardrop. So they look differently. You know how I showed you that capped brood was all very flat against the frame. Um, the the um, queen cell would be like, kind of like coming out like an almond, like a teardrop. Yeah, oh, here's one. There, okay, this is a drone. Can you see that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See how much Watch bigger he is? Mm -hmm. See how big he is down there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and they're, you know, they're sort of big and fat and furry. And um, another little fun fact is they don't sting. So there's their sole purpose in life is to mate with a queen. Obviously not their queen, but somebody else to, to get the gene pool right. And, um, and after they mate, they die. So um, it actually, the apparatus with which they mate, it gets pulled out of their thorax when they, when they um, after they mate. And um, another fun fact is they really, they really can't feed themselves or do anything. And so um, they're a liability over the winter. Remember I said that, you know, there's no hibernation, they're all up and around. And so they eat too much. So they are kicked out of the hive once the cold weather starts. And so you'll see in the fall, uh, you'll see sort of some dead drones out there. So the drone population dies off and then they bring it back again in the, in the spring. Yeah, wait, let me see if point to again. It's right there. That one. Yeah, uh, that's the only one I see. So I'm going to poke through here and get more into the, where I would think the brood nest would be. And the other thing, when you're starting out as a beekeeper, you know, you're so excited to go into the hive. But really, when we're going into the hive, we're sort of disrupting it. <laughs> you know, you're making them a little less efficient. So um, it's a balance of, I mean, at the, at the beginning, you know, during the springtime, you really should go in once a week. It's good. You're just monitoring them and see what's going on. And there's a lot more activities then because you're trying to, as I said, you know, manage the, the possibility of a swarm. But then when you get into the honey flow, you're kind of trying to let them do some work and, um, maximize ah, the honey production. So this is light as well. So that is jam packed. So this see that thing hanging down. I don't know if you saw that. See how right here on the right, it's like barrel of monkeys. Yeah. So we call that <laughs> festooning. And there, um, it's just the Jean, way to hang on. Jean, can you stop it? Thanks. Sorry. So I said that's called festooning when I said barrel of monkeys, but I couldn't remember what that eggs actually, um, why they did that. So I looked it up and um, they really don't understand exactly why they do it. Um, and one of the uh, scientists speculate a few things and most agree that it's around wax production. So they're kind of like measuring things and um, sort of using that as scaffolding. That was the, that was what the book, you know, said, um, you know, measuring distances, acting like scaffolding so that it's a bridge. It's kind of neat. Anyway, just wanted to share that. That is jam packed. So this, see that thing hanging down? I don't know if you saw that. See how right here on the right, it's like barrel of monkeys. Yeah. So we call that festooning. And there, um, that's just the way they hang on to each other, it's kind of neat. Bees are very social, you know, they feed each other. Um, I don't know what's on that side. Let me see. Oh yeah, so see that is a beautiful wall of brood. But you can see this, they are gonna, I'm gonna have to feed them again tomorrow. I mean, they'll slam that feeder tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
there's, there's, they've like eaten up everything that was in. There was a lot of honey in here. So I was saying they're very social. They feed each other. They've done studies where they've given, put some dye in some nectar and fed it to a few bees and then looked later to see, you know, where it went. Like, I guess infrared light or black light or whatever. And they could see how it spread throughout the hive. Um, I'm always amazed at all these facts that they figure out about bees and I'm curious how they know them. <laughs> but so anyway, during the, during the winter months, the bees will winter over. But during the summer months, um, the bee lifespan is about six weeks. So, and during that time, because they're just like, it's accelerated, they're doing a heck of a lot of activity. And they, during that time, they progress through like being um, a nurse bee, a house cleaning bee, a, um, you know, like I said, removing carcasses before, that was like house cleaning, like a dead larva, dead pupa. Um, also um, sort of cordoning off any kind of beetles. They try to sort of keep them, shoe them to the outside. Um, then the guard bees on the outside, making sure there's no um, other attack bees coming in. And then their final uh, final progression or maturation is that they're um, foraging and bringing back pollen and nectar from outside. So, um, and they are, um, I said they live about six weeks. Um, and you know, there's only one queen per hive and the queen actually will um, usually live, could live from like two to five years. I've never really had one live past two years. For one reason or another, they either swarm, maybe she lives, but she's living somewhere else or they decide to replace her because it's just, she's not, she's failing, she's not doing well. Um, they do a lot of communicating through pheromones and the queen, if there is a problem, like let's say our neighbor here was to do a big spray and kill all my foragers, which are the mature bees. Um, if there's a sudden, you know, drop in that kind of population, the queen can change and I, I'm gonna forget, I think it's like the Johnson pheromone she can then emit that and sort of uh, encourage, that will, that will get the bees to go on to a later phase in life. Like they'll all of a sudden realize they need to go out oh. and, isn't that huh. neat? That That's is neat. Cool. It's very neat. Um, the alarm pheromone. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. So, well, first off, do you have any questions? Cause I wanna go back and talk about the installation too, so. I do. We were talking about the stuff they used to seal off. You said they get it from sap. Do they collect it like they do pollen or how do they do that? Yeah, they're, yes, they're collecting it. Um, they, I don't know if they put it in their mouth. I will have to look that up. I don't know, but it's, um, it, they use it for sealing out. It does have antioxidant properties and it's from sap and tree buds. I went and looked that up too. Cause I was like, I think that's from that. Yeah. So, um, and it's very kind of like sticky. Um, Right, I mean, you guys, you guys know that, right? I mean, it's right. <laughs> it's better than Gorilla Glue. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I mean, it's like you know, it's just stuck on there. But um, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm guessing that it seems waxy to me. So I feel like they would be using their mandibles, which is kind of like their you know their jaw, mm -hmm. to like manipulate it and stuff. Kind of chew it up to get the consistency. Yeah. yeah. I think somebody had told me that once that that was a little bit what people, you know, olden times used a little bit to help clean their teeth, you know, I'm not quite sure what if like you're, I don't know what it would do, but I feel like I've heard that. Uh, you're, you're muted, Jean. Chan, do you know anything about that? Chan is our um, dental professional on the call. No, oh, that's, uh, that's news to me. I might should have known about it a lot, lot, long time ago. Well, I feel like I should look that up. I, I there's something that there's some they did something with the for for teeth. I'm not sure what it is. So. Well, I think it does have uh, very strong medicinal benefits, wound yeah. healing, and that sort of thing, as does honey. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Do you do you get a lot of honey? It depends on the year. I mean, yeah. I've, I've gotten a lot before. This year, I only harvested like six frames. So um, yeah. that was our experience too. Yeah, yeah. We had less. We had about half what we did the year before. But yeah. So I think it's because it was so rainy this year. It was definitely rainy. Yeah, very rainy, and I think they ate them, ate it up. Well, and I also <laughs> had I had a swarm because we had twice as many hives and half as much honey this year. 
yeah. we did the year before. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's a labor of love, you know, I mean, some yeah. years, I mean, I remember the first, I probably got a harvest, like the first four years I, I did it. And then I went through, I didn't get it for like three more years, you know? So it oh, just really? sort of, yeah, it just sort of depends if you have a, a swarm at the wrong time and, you know, who knows what, or if it's really dry and there's a short honey flow and your population isn't built up enough at that point. So, um, any, any other questions? You, feel free to like jump in with them. Um, What's your best way to find the queen? So I just, you know, you just look. I mean, I know she usually would not be, so, I, you know, here I'm going to be, call myself wrong, but um, she's typically not on the outer frame. The outer frames are usually where there's jam packed with honey and pollen. And so um, that, but we saw her, I think on the second frame in which is just unusual. Usually the brood yeah. nest is in the middle yeah. and, and it's bless okay. you, bless you. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, and I, and I, I usually know. look for her not on a capped frame. You remember how I pulled up and you could see like a wall of capped brood. She's not likely to be on there because there's no place for her to lay there. So it's usually on a frame that has open brood cells um, or empty cells. Do you want me to pull up the video again from the beginning or do you no, want to drive from here? Yeah, let me drive if, that, if okay. that's okay. Yeah, yeah you um, should have permissions to do so. Yeah. W was somebody else going to ask something just then? Yeah, I was. Yeah. Yes, I did. He was. Go um, good pointing. Uh, talking about the mating flight, the sperm she collects, that's going to last her the rest of her life. Yeah. For that one mating flight. Wow. Yeah. Stop Isn't that up. crazy? Yeah. You know, and so I talked a little bit about those pheromones. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, I talked about it briefly, but I have a slide that talks about the different ones, but there's really a lot. And one of the things is that she, uh, the, the drones are um, circling in this area called the drone catchment area, believe it or not. And they're emitting a pheromone for her, for, you know, for other queens to, to recognize that they're there. So it's, it's really, really kind of neat, <laughs> you know, that's, you know, there's, they, they have a pheromone for that. They have a pheromone also for um, that the, the brood emit that is telling, basically a signaling to the nurse bees that they need to feed them, you know? Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really neat. The other, one of the other very common pheromones is the alarm pheromone, which is what, you know, if when they die, they emit it. So it's like, you know, kill, kill, kill. So if they're stinging you, it's like they're emitting that pheromone to tell other ones to sting you. Or if you accidentally, like you notice I, I do it without gloves on because I learned um, that first summer um, that you, I'm just way more, um, I'm way more nimble, you know, and have good dexterity. And I mash a lot of them when they're, when they're, when I have my gloves on and then that just makes them mad, <laughs> you know, so just me. So. Hmm. And that the queen lays about 2,000 eggs a day. Yeah. Dude. Is that crazy? Wow. So that's yeah. an interesting little tidbit. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that's really neat. Um, <clears throat> another, so, so the, the installation, that package is, um, is three pounds of bees, which is, equates to about 12,000 bees, typically in a package. And <clears throat> they... Um, you saw I suspended that queen cage in there. And basically it's, it's, a, it's got usually seven attendants, seven workers and one queen. And then it's plugged up with fondant, which it's plugged up with a sugary thing like fondant. And um, so the, the, you suspend it with that hole, that plugged hole facing up. And the worker bees on the inside are eating from it. And the, the worker bees from the outside in, that are in the surrounding hive are eating from the other side. And that usually takes, I mean, up to a week, but I usually go in and release it after like five days if they aren't already out, if she isn't already out. But it gives them time to get used to her smell. Because if you were to put in a, a new, a, just a queen right in there, they'd probably attack her. So, <clears throat> so another fun fact is that the queen does not, um, she can sting as many times as you like, as she likes. So I learned that the hard way when I'm, I'm, um, was holding my thing the wrong way. Did you see me trying to get, um, I was trying to work off the little strap and, and work off the little, um, cork that plugs it. Cause you got to get that out of there. And, um, I was holding it. And I got like three stings before I was like, ah, and I didn't want it. This was like years ago. 
And I look at it and I knew that the queen could sing multiple times, but I just wasn't thinking. And I look at it and I'm like, well, nobody's dead, but she got me. <laughs> so anyway, um, so you suspend it in there and you're waiting for her to get released or you release her. And then they, you know, usually accept her and it's, it's wonderful. And you try to make sure that she's laying by seeing some of those eggs within a week. Well, I had one of my packages that I installed where it, she wasn't laying and they were like, well, maybe she isn't th this particular hive. They, it, was, it wasn't a mated queen that I bought. So I had to wait for her to go fly and get mated. So I waited and waited. And the problem is if they sit queenless for like three weeks, then what happens is one of the, the workers, one of the female workers will become a laying worker. And so I didn't know anything about this. And I go to inspect my hive. Remember I told you it's one little, it looks like a little piece of rice and it's perfectly in the center of the cell. Well, I opened it up and there were like four and five eggs, like kind of thrown in each of the cells. And I was like, what is this? This is like, this is so gross. And so I went to the bee store and this is so funny. They're like, oh, you have a laying worker. And I was like, how do I get rid of her? And they're like, you take out the frames. Do you guys know this Chandler? Do you guys, this is so crazy. You take out the frame one at a time and you walk like 200 feet away from the hive and you shake it off. And then you bring back the, like you, you shake them all until it's empty. And then you take the box and shake it off. And then you come back and you set the whole empty thing up and all of them will come back except for the laying worker. And it worked. The, so you mean the, that you you shook all the bees off? Yes, over like two hundred feet away from my hive. And they all come back except that. Yes, layer. apparently she hasn't like she hasn't she's one of the young hot bees and she doesn't know how to get back yet. She hasn't been out. I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, okay, but that's the way you do it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So they, I mean, that's actually a good, okay. I'm going to share my screen. You guys ask me questions. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it's going to work, but I have a cool little picture that I took. So Arlene so, was just, do you want to tell them that you, you interviewed me? I, I'm on the employee forum at UNC. And in fact, I'm on part of my, part of my role at the employee forum is I'm the liaison to the advisory board for the Carolina community garden. So oh. years ago I interviewed Ann for the employee newsletter in touch. So I have pictures of Ann hold, you know, holding frames and pointing out the bees and small world. That's crazy. Okay, here we are on that, that, that thing again. Hopefully it's gonna. I have a question about um, the swarming. Are you kidding me? If, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just my. It's okay. I've... It's it messing up again. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> the video worked. So that was, yeah. that was good. Um, so when they swarm, if you were to set up another set of hot, you know, set box, would they swarm there? Right. So, well, you would like them to. So um, <laughs> um, I did. No, you can't control I, am, them. <laughs> I am so excited because I set up a trap this year. And because um, once the bees decide they're going to swarm, there's some things you can do to try and stave it off. But when they want to swarm, they want to swarm. So we call that a split. If you try to get ahead of it and move those queen cells into another baby hive, kind of, so to speak, and you're going to make your own little hive. But I um, didn't get ahead of it. I saw the swarm happen, which was crazy. And it was way up in a tree. And I, you know, it was too high. A lot of times you can knock it down. Mm -hmm. In fact, I knocked one out of my neighbor's tree that I could just put a ladder up and get to it. But this one, I set up a trap. And so you set up, we call it a nuke box, which nuke box, which is a small hive box that fits about five frames in it. And you put um, fra um, frames in it that had previously had brood in it, you know, it had baby um, bees in it. And, um, and then lemongrass. So you buy lemongrass oil and hmm. put it, I put it on like all these like cotton balls and put it around. I mean, in my backyard, it smelled like, like, um, <laughs> grass. Didn't have any but, mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, no, no mosquitoes. But they, they came in there. It was crazy. It was really crazy. Wow. So, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of cool. I, um, anyway, I'm just going to pull up this one slide and move it over to there. So um, what were we talking about that I was gonna show you? Gosh, darn it. Oh, here. Um, all right, well, I'll show you this thing first. So this, can you see this? Not yet. I'll make it really big. I'm in, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. You can see your PowerPoint slide, but you need to make it, yeah, there you go. Is that bigger? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, hopefully it'll work in the animation right now because um, this is, uh, you know, just how they, so they go, this is kind of funny. People don't know, realize this. Like, so the way that the, the, the bees will progress through, here, let me go through this first, sorry. Bees will progress through this maturation cycle. So um, if you can, can you read over here? Is that big enough? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first for days one and two, there it, uh, it says cleaning cells and keeping um, brood warm. So those are kind of like housekeeping kind of, you know, bees. Then days three, four, and five, this is after they hatch. Three, four, and five, then they're feeding the older larva. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Then they go on to feeding younger larva. It's like, you know, it's just like you would for, you don't let your, you, know, you need an older person to take care of that little baby. And then, um, then days two, through, excuse me, 12 through 17, they're produce, producing wax and um, building the combs, uh, transporting food within the hive. So remember I talked about that dye that they did, those, that mm -hmm. experiment. So they're feeding each other. Um, then they progress to guarding the hive entrance from any other bees. Like, you know, they will be robbed. I had my hive at the garden robbed from the other hive there because I was feeding it with an external feeder. You know, you saw the one that I showed in that video is like a thing on top. So nobody can get to that except for the girls inside. But when I had, uh, you can also feed it by kind of turning a big mason jar upside down at the front of the hive. And that can cause, you know, a stronger hive to, to rob your other hive. But anyway, um, so they're guiding, guarding the hive entrance. And then the last bulk of their life is uh, going out and forest foraging. So they're going out and, you know, bringing out the pollen and the nectar, searching out. And, and they will fly um, in a three to five mile radius and then um, go flower to flower. They will work whatever section they're, they're at. So in other words, if there's like a blueberry crop right in front, they are gonna go back and work that blueberry crop until it is worked. You know what I mean? Until it is completely pollinated. It's not like they're gonna do blueberries today and then a little bit of strawberries tomorrow and blah, 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 blah. you know, they go and do that whole thing, which is kind of cool. They also um, will go from source to source and then when they wanna go back to the hive, they go straight to the hive. They make a beeline for the hive. <laughs> I love that. So um, there's just so many really neat things about them and they're so intelligent. And honestly, I, um, like I said, was not really interested in them at all. In fact, I thought they were you know, a nuisance, <laughs> was showing my ignorance. And, um, and then when I started learning about this, they're so intelligent and really they act collectively as a hive. You know, they're a community. And, um, so the way the population is, is um, controlled is through the worker bees. So, um, you know, they are building out the size of the cell. You know, they have wax glands that secrete the wax and then they build out these beautifully perfect hexagons. And the size of them, a normal, I'll say a normal cell is what um, a worker bee, a, a, a fertilized egg, a female bee will be um, fertilized in. So the queen will stick her head in there realize that it's that size, then she'll put her tail in there, lay an egg and fertilize it. And that will develop as a fertilized egg. Likewise, if the female bees collectively build out a larger cell, that's gonna house a drone or a unfertilized um, bee. So the queen will stick her head in there. She realizes what size it is. She puts her tail in, lays an egg and does not fertilize it. And that develops into a drone. So it's, it's collectively, the females are building out those cells because they understand what is needed. So if you heard, like I couldn't find, I think I might've found some br drone brood in that last bottom box. But remember I was saying, I can't find any drone brood to show you because it's the end of the season. You know, you, typically you're not, you're not wanting, a, they're not wanting to reproduce because that hive isn't gonna succeed. But in the spring, you definitely see drone brood. Um, so, and likewise, um, if they, they will feed them. Remember I told you about feeding them for the first three days, everybody gets royal jelly, but then they switch over for all except for who they want if they needed a queen. And so that is, they would just continue to feed a fertilized cell, that royal jelly. So that, and then build it out. Um, and you can see this is, this is the shape of a, that's showing that teardrop, what it would look like. Actually, I have another picture. Um, um, de -dum, de -dum, de -dum. I think this one is it. How do you make it animate right now? I, let's see, hold on. Ah. Ah. <laughs> oh. Okay, oh my gosh, it's working. 
Oh my gosh, this is very exciting. Oh, this is very exciting. Okay, hold on. Um, I wanna skip through to that just to show you that really quick. See, isn't that cool? You can see there's yeah. the worker on top, uh -huh. the queen in the middle and the drone on the bottom. So that gives you a relative feeling for their size differences. Um, and this is what I was just showing you a minute ago. And good that I had, here's the, here's the little life cycle. This shows how long it, a queen, it only takes 16, sorry, you can't see my finger. It only takes 16 days um, for a queen cell to develop, which is funny to me because, you know, it's the most complicated, I think, but they're, um, I guess it's because they're giving her that nutrient rich um, royal jelly and the fact that it's so important that they get a queen up and running. A so do they, do they know when the queen is getting ready to die? Is that why they would? That's a great question. So they, um, they, we call that a failing queen. And so typically, as you heard me say, I've really never had one last more than two years. You can start to see, like if they haven't taken care of it for me, if I see that she's got a bad laying pa pattern, I'm gonna go um, pinch her head. Um, which I've done, and and the um, they will either decide that themselves and start to create. Um, these are called those are called supersedure cells, and so do you see how this swarm cell is down here? Mm -hmm. A supersedure cell is more interspersed up here, so that's kind of how they're telling you what what they think. You know, like this is like they're going to replace her by putting them up here, but it's the same kind of thing, although they're not going to leave. <laughs> they just wait. They just sit there and wait and watch the battle themselves, you know? So they're laying the eggs, they're, they're, they're creating the queens. And then once they hatch, I mean, shoot, the, the existing queen will, might go and try and rip them down too, but she's probably weaker and won't survive. So I think that's so cool. Um, and then, so workers take 21 days to hatch and drones take 24 days to hatch. Um, here's what I wanted to show you. So this is regular um, flat, this is uh, uh, like worker bee, um, worker bee brood, capped brood. And this is drone brood. See how it looks more mm -hmm. like bulbous. Mm -hmm. And then this one's a queen cell. That's an unfortunate queen cell. <laughs> Look how perfect it is, <laughs> but that's yeah. a bummer. Okay, that was at the end, let me go back up. Um, so I want to show you through some of these things because they're kind of neat. I, so I realize if you have to go, you're not going to offend me. I realize we're over our time. So, um, so it's just little things. Honeybees are invertebrates. So um, they have a rigid exoskeleton. Uh, you can see they have the three main body parts. This is for the, the geeks in you if you want to just see some of this science. So the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, Wings, there's two pair of wings. You can see the hollow lines carry the nerves and circulation. And they have tiny hooks that um, are attaching called, I guess it's hamuli. <laughs> okay, so the eyes, they have compound eyes. And um, you can see it's sending these mosaic images to the brain. Then they also have these three, this A, B, and C down here. This uh, ocelli, I think is how you say it, that uh, ocelli, but they, um, that's the polar, they use the polar light to orient themselves to where their um, hive is. So remember how I said they could go flower to flower to flower to flower, and then they go back to the hive that way using the, the polar light. So I've had to move a hive several times through the years. And what you wanna do is wait for the bees to all get back in the evening when it's dark and then you seal up the hive. You put a, a, a hive reducer and put some duct tape on to close it up and then you move it. And then you take the, the, the open up the entrance again, but you always lay like a piece of wood against, you can't see my hand, like just against the, the front of the hive. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they come out in the morning and they kind of hit it. And it's, it's kind of like telling your kids like, okay, stop, pay attention. Where are you going? So you know to come back. And that helps orient them to make sure they stop and pay attention and reorient themselves to where the hive is. So you leave that up for a few days. Again, another trick that beekeepers have taught me. Um, I will say inevitably, whenever I move, I always see the next day or two, like 50 bees 
flying around the old location. (laughs) (laughs) I'm guessing they were the ones that were out late the night before, but you know, so, um, but it's, it's really neat. So the other thing about the, um, the bees, so this is what we see, but they see this. Likewise here, this is what we see. You can see my cursor, right? Yes. And, but they see this. And so the whole point is that you can see how it's, I mean, what's it highlighting for them? You see how it's highlighting? Yeah. The stamen in the middle. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's like target bullseye. Here you go. This is what you need. Yep. So it, it's kind of neat. Yeah. And these colors have evolved, you know, to attract them. We see all these beautiful colors because they're really screaming out, come pollinate me. Um, so uh, this is kind of neat if for, you know, this is sort of comparing about our, our senses. And so they can detect air pressure um, so to basically hear and measure the wind speed. So, um, and that their antennae also have structures that smell, taste, feel, and measure temperature, humidity, speed, electric fields, carbon dioxide, and gravity. So we, um, I, some of the materials that I have from the, um, the Orange County Beekeeping Association that I could actually hold up are showing that um, bees have actually been used in bomb sniffing squads. I guess in Iraq they were, Is that, I mean, that's just, I'm not quite sure how they did that, but they used a team of bees. So I guess they, there must be some way I'm guessing with the electric fields that they could let a swarm go and see where it, it migrates to, where, they, where they're attracted. Yeah, there are lots of people who are very uh, uh, good at looking at bee, um, and I, you know they've been studying bee behavior for a long time, and they do different dances for different reasons, and that's probably how they can do bomb sniffing is because they they know it not that they've trained the bees, but they know that when they encounter an electromagnetic field that they do a certain kind of dance. So that's, that's probably how they, yeah, you're probably right. That's probably I've, so I know about the waggle dances and there's, there's like three different ones that they do as far as like one's in a big circle, one's in a figure eight. And I forget what the other one is, but that is their directional things for showing where nectar and pollen are. And so they can, but I bet you there's one, you're probably right. That's what they, how they, how they communicate where that electric field is. Um, but they're really, you know, it's, it's really, really neat. They're just, Mm -hmm. um, fascinating in my, in my mind. Um, so this is the, um, the, uh, to manipulate the wax, they're using the mandible, their mandibles. Um, uh, the tongue is moves up and down. That's what collects the the nectar. I mean, that's (laughs) their tongue, the glossa. And then, um, and it rolls up, you know, you've, you've probably seen it. You've probably seen butterfly ones, Mm -hmm. you know, you can see them all like roll out like a slinky. Um, this is the, these are the glands, the different glands that I was talking about. Um, so the Nastanov one is one that people are generally familiar with beekeepers because that's what they're using to, um, attract. So when they swarm and they want to go somewhere, they're, you know, going in a cluster, but they're also emitting that pheromone. So it's like, come, come here, you know, come hither. Um, uh, so, uh, there's the, I can't even pronounce that, but that's the alarm pheromone. Um, the turgal one is to adra- attract drones. Oh, and inhibit workers. So I think you heard me say, I think I said this in the video that if your workers were all, um, killed in with a spray or something, um, sh- the queen can emit pheromone to like advance their age. And likewise, she can also, um, they, I think they collectively, the workers can also emit a pheromone that stunts the age of the younger ones for, for progressing because they, you know, it's like, okay, we have a lot on, on duty right now. We have a lot on deck. We don't need you to progress through to this yet. So it's, it's, it's very symbiotic. It's very neat. Um, this is, I cannot take credit for these slides. I, you know, these, you can tell these ones are very fun, <laughs> but basically <laughs> what, what, what I want to tell you here is like, can you see the serration on these, on the stinger? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely serrated. So it works its way in there. So the best way to get your, 
uh, if you get stung to get it out, you want to take like a credit card or, you know, that kind of thing and scrape or your nail and scrape it out. You don't want to pull it because you're also just squeezing out more venom with the bulbous tip of it. So you always just want to scrape it out. So you can see that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it works its way in. So you just try to want to try and get it out. Okay, and I showed you these. So um, let me see here. What other? Does anyone else have any questions? Let me pull up my notes because I want to make sure I like hit on stuff. I don't have a question so much as just a comment that. Um, Several years ago, um, in my the house that I grew up in, uh, I had moved off to college and um, came home after I don't know for like Christmas holiday or something like that. And there were bees that were flying around all around inside my bedroom. <laughs> that had <laughs> I'm like, Mom, we got to do something about these bees. I got to sleep here. So. We ended up calling a bee, a bee. We didn't want to kill them because we, I was pretty sure they were honeybees because there was honey all over the room. Oh, and it was that. just oh stuff God. all over the room. That is hysterical. Yeah. So a beekeeper came. We did find, figure out, I don't know, I didn't even know where she found them, but she found somebody because we didn't want to exterminate them. We, you know, we knew that they well, were against there. against the law, at least now, to exterminate them. I don't know about then. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is back 80s. So I have no idea. But we just we just didn't we knew that they were honeybees. We didn't want to hurt them. So we got a beekeeper to come out and he took out he says he's never seen such a huge hive. Wow. It was under the eaves that was underneath my bedroom, kind of like there it was a, you know, one of these um, split level homes. And then the yeah. top floor had an eaves kind of under it. Yeah. They had gotten into the eaves under near my bedroom and built this huge i mean probably seven foot long hive oh. incredible um and he ended up giving us some of the honey but he was so thankful that we called him because he's like yeah this is a really <laughs> great find for me i've got a place for these guys so uh but it, it was it was amazing i got stung it was okay but you know i you know because I, I watched him take them out he had a suit on and i didn't but um, yeah, it, that's, um, that's, they love, um, any way to get in between the eaves of houses or, um, I've seen in a trunk of a car, you know, that hasn't been used that they were able to get in through a hole, you know, they're just looking for a safe spot. Usually it's up more because they don't want, you know, like if there were going to be a bear or something, you know, they want to st stay clear of predators. But, this was um, perfect for them because it was, you know, it was shielded from the rain and it yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. had but a nice long span for them to multiply and do their thing. And so that is crazy. Did yeah. you take pictures? I We didn't. We didn't take pictures. Um, of course, you know, that was before the digital camera age. Right, was, right. You know, the best we could do is a polar, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know. That's so. <laughs> great. That's really, it's amazing. But that's, you know, people are usually say like, well, when they're swarming, where are they going to look for a place? But that's basically what it is. Some, you know, place to get in between boards or something within a house or, um, uh, you know, uh, they will go like to a hollowed out tree if it's up high enough. So unfortunately, feral bees are becoming more and more uncommon. You know, there's just disease has gotten them. Um, and we've really, um, you know, paved paradise to put up a parking lot, you know, it's, it's, yes. um, we're taking away their habitat. So um, actually that's a great segue to, you know, those are the things that really are, um, people ask about this colony collapse disorder, and we really have not seen that in North Carolina, but, um, uh, you know, things that lead to that are the, the, you know, it's, it's like a general, they think of it more as like a, almost like an HIV, like an AIDS kind of thing for bees, like it's weakening the immune system, but it's caused by poor nutrition, uh, a, a, a con convergence of all these poor nutrition, um, mites, you know, which is the varroa mite is a very common pest that came over here from um, Europe in the eighties. And it's now it's a matter of not, it's just if, not if, but when, like you're gonna get them, you gotta treat, you gotta, you gotta check for them. And then the other is um, unfortunately pesticides you know, people using that kind of stuff. And, you know, they, they've started to get smart about neonicotinoids. I don't know if you've heard people, people call them neonics, but that's really something that stays systemic in the, um, 
in the plant and then, you know, they found it in the wax, you know, um, so uh, yeah, it's, you know, hopefully we can, I, I encourage people to plant a pollinator garden, you know, plant things that are bee friendly, um, visit your local farmer, go to the farmer's market, because they are usually not doing monocrop farming, you know, which monocrop is much more like just, you know, soybeans and corn and and there's just not it's like feast or famine for the bees you know um well, I, have, I have a huge glossy abelia three of them out in my backyard that i planted years ago because i like gardening and figured oh they'll pollinate my you know my tomatoes and my my things that i like to grow and i'll tell you this thing is probably you know seven or eight feet tall and it is just loaded and they just love of course, my dog loves chasing the bees around. <laughs> but um, but but the other thing, I, I do have a question about Africanized bees. What what kind of an impact is that having so, on our honeybee population? So Africanized bees, we have not found them here in in North Carolina, but they are. Well, actually, I take that back. I, I think they found one in like ninety or ninety one um, on the coast, um, but they they are in. Louisiana, Texas, Florida. Um, and uh, so the, the funny, not funny, but the thing about them is they're actually really efficient. It's almost like they're a hyper bee. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're really great pollinators. They're really great at honey production, but they have a heightened um, alarm. All of that is very much more heightened. So they're way more aggressive. And you know, it's, it's like an issue that they kill livestock in those areas because they'll just, you know, they just attack, you know, when they, when they feel threatened. Um, they're actually, it's a, a big deal in, um, <clears throat> I think it's Texas, not Florida, but you know, those like your power or your water meter thing, how it's kind of like a little, like, mm -hmm. it's like recessed into the ground, you know, mm -hmm. apparently that's like a place where they will nest a lot. So it's like a, a big problem for them. Huh. Um, the other thing is too, they, that's why there are very strict rules around um, ports, ports of entry, because you don't, you're not allowed to have a registered, you're supposed to register your hives. You're not allowed to have one within three miles of a port because they do not want any of those drones mating with any of our queens, you know, of a queen that's here. So, and that's not just our huh. port, that's ports. Yeah. Cause that's, you know, that's how they, that's how these things are transported. Right. That's mm -hmm. been for ages, yeah. right. They come yeah. over on boats from mm -hmm. continent to continent. True. So, um, yeah. So yeah, they freak me out a little bit. Um, they, they were doing some, I, I mean, this is a while back when, you know, I told you Jack Tapp is the one who his apiary. I, I learned a lot. I actually volunteered for him that first summer and went into thousands of hives. I w went there three days a week. And, um, they were right at the end starting, they were working with somebody at NC State to artificially inseminate their queens. You know, I was like, wow, I'm not quite sure how you do that, but. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, um, it, but in, in for the reason being is if they're, they need to be proactive about trying to not have any kind of Africanized bees mate. So I don't know what, I, I really need to read up on that. I don't know where that's gone. Um, yeah. What else? What else can I tell you? Oh, I didn't tell you about honey. That's the one I think I was going to, right. I didn't tell you about this. Is it going to, is it going to let me progress through? So the way they, they basically are going through honey is, um, or making honey is through their, um, they, it, I, I like to tell the kids that it's bee vomit times two. So what mm -hmm. happens is they go and collect the nectar, they come bring back to the hive and then feed it to another um, bee and feed it to a bee. It goes into their stomach and regurg you know, um, the enzymes work on it. And then they regurgitate it to another bee and their enzymes work on it. I don't know why it's not showing up in there anyway. Um, and, um, and then they are able to regurgitate it into a cell and it, there it stores and they wait until the water content gets down to about, it's somewhere around 18%. And they, they know when it happens and they, they're fanning it and letting it dry out and then they cap it off. And so um, the capped honey is like perfect. You don't have to do anything with it. When you extract it, you just 
run it through a strainer a few times and you can store it. And they, they've found um, honey in the, the pyramids that was edible. Mm -hmm. So as long as it doesn't have water in it, if it has, if they had, if you'd taken the harvest when it wasn't capped, it um, will end up fermenting, you know? So it'll turn bad. Weed. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, that's, um, it's kind of neat. There's my smoker. And this was a picture of the package. I was pulling this up earlier. That's what the package of bees look like sitting on my counter before I installed them. I guess it won't get any bigger. Wow. Yeah. How big a space do you need for a hive? So you just need the footprint of the hive. So people have them on um, uh, uh, fire escapes in New York City. You just oh, have to. Wow. You just have to have the footprint because they fly. They're not. They're not hanging around. You know. I mean, they're hanging there in their nest, but then they they leave to go forage and whatnot. So yeah, are you thinking about it, Tracy? Dive in. <laughs> I I. I know I don't know nearly as much as you know, and yes, I have thought about it. I my husband will let me have chickens, so this is my next thing. So, <laughs> well, I'm telling you, uh, honeybees smell a heck of a lot better than chickens. I bet they do. <laughs> they really do. The hive smell. I, I don't know if you that was in that part of the hive the video, but when I opened it, that might have gotten cut. But it smells so good, and I was like, you guys should smell it. Oh yeah, it, it does. just it smells wonderfully. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's the one thing about that bedroom. It did. It smelled really good. <laughs> it was very delicious smelling. <laughs> that is that is a hysterical story. Where did you Where did you grow up? Where was that? Um, this was in Northern Durham County, okay. way out in the country. Um, yeah, almost in Cha almost in Roxborough, um, near so, Bahama. Yeah, near Bahama. Yeah, Bahama. <laughs> near Bahama. <it>. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. And yeah. this is Chan. I just wanted to say uh, how much we've enjoyed your presentation and what a nice job you've done of it. And yes. uh, I hope um, Gene will um, give uh, high marks to Grant for a really superb videography. I, you know, <laughs> yeah. close up so, Tracy and Arlene, my husband was the um, holding the iPhone. <laughs> I was standing nearby getting eaten by mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> so we did we did edit it down a little bit. Um, there was a lot more conversation than you heard on this yeah. video. We did some cutting imagine. and splicing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good editing. Well, you know, it's amazing what uh, excellent photography you can do with the uh, iPhone, particularly the latest ones. They're just superb. That's that's why I recruited him because he had a newer phone than I have. He had the extra cameras on his. Oh, yeah. So um, he just stood and he said he should get some credit for standing that close to the bees as well. Oh yeah, well he should get a purple heart or something. In the <laughs> he didn't find though. Did you see how calm those bees were? They were great. Yeah, I, yeah, they I, were I really give you good. high marks for a very gentle beekeeping. That's beautiful to see. Well, no. thank you, know, you. One thing I might just toss in, and you, I'm sure you're aware of it, but to those um, folks that are, want to continue learning a little bit, uh, one of the nicest and most, I think, um, reliable sources uh, for online information is the University of Guelph um, in Canada. They have a, a whole series of, uh, of, of uh, YouTube type videos on most any aspect of, of uh, beekeeping that you are interested in. And you can pull them up in a matter of seconds and, uh, and go to school right there in front of, you, uh, of your computer. So check it out if you haven't. Uh, it's G-U-E-L-P-H, University of Guelph. Thank you, I didn't know yeah, about thank that. That's a wonderful resource. And uh, uh, they are, it's, it's um, you know, there's a lot of junk. <laughs> In about bee, uh, high, beehives and beekeeping out there yeah. too, but this one is uh, really uh, high quality. I, I will add to that too. Is NC State is awesome. They oh. they yeah. they have a tremendous, and also Ohio State University has a great um, series that you can um, you know you, you don't have you, you just anybody can log on and get it and, and subscribe to their webinars. So right. yeah, go Tar Heels. Yeah, 